Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Side Project, another one today where we dive into some giant sports stadium that got built for an important event and then the country realized that they didn't really need it at all. It's the abandoned arenas in the Amazon, Brazil's 2014 FIFA World Cup. No sporting event inspires excitement quite like the World Cup. Not for this guy, couldn't care less. Football or soccer is the most popular sport worldwide for some reason, and the country that adores it the most might be Brazil. In 2014, the South American nation had the opportunity to host the World Cup for the first time since 1950. In the 64 years since their last time hosting, the competition has changed dramatically. It now requires billions of dollars of investment in public infrastructure and football stadiums. Brazil promised the expensive development would greatly benefit the nation's people, and not just in Rio or Sao Paulo. Brazilian officials promised new construction in 12 cities throughout the country, including some that received very little investment and attention previously. But with the games approaching, it became clear that not all of the promises were going to be delivered. Some of Brazil's most famous footballers called out the government for lack of follow-through on the projects. FIFA questioned whether the arenas would be ready in time. People in isolated cities in the middle of the Amazon asked whether spending hundreds of millions of dollars on a football stadium was really worth it when they had much simpler and cheaper needs. To some, the Brazil World Cup of 2014 was an embarrassment. But were the games as much of a shame as so many people claimed? Today we're going to look into this question by looking at the plans for infrastructure development, the arenas that were built, and the lasting legacy of the 2014 World Cup. In 2003, FIFA announced that the hosts of the 2014 World Cup would be a South American nation. Colombia and Brazil declared their candidacy, and in 2007, Colombia withdrew. So Brazil was chosen to host the events that meant so much to the country. The Brazilian Confederation submitted a plan to FIFA to have 12 different cities host at least four games each. And FIFA approved. Despite winning the right to host by default, Brazil have forward an ambitious plan for preparing. Of course, they would need new stadiums, and many of the existing stadiums, some of which were built for the 1950 World Cup, required extravagant renovations. I don't know, I'll just theme it as the retro World Cup and stick with the one in the 1950s, it would be cheaper. But that wouldn't be all. Brazil needed bigger airports, new roads, new rail, office space for media, upgraded hotels for visitors, and housing for footballers. Altogether, Brazil announced 93 projects across the country. Throughout the process, the government said all the right things. The National Minister for Cities declared that usefulness and sustainability would be a priority. <laughs> Planning committees insisted the costs would be kept down. After all, past World Cups and Olympics had shown that expensive, elaborate construction rarely paid off in situations like these. The federal government teamed up with FIFA to set an overall budget of $13 billion. Most of this would come from the taxpayers and public development banks. But this didn't all go into construction. About a billion was set aside for security, and $576 million was set aside for prize money, the largest pot ever. Miraculously, and Somewhat unusually for a side project's video, the event would come in actually under budget. But believe it or not, that actually wasn't a good thing. During the bidding process, the Brazilian government asserted that all public spending on construction would improve infrastructure. It's unclear in retrospect just how much money was set aside for this infrastructure, as the number has been muddied by a lack of transparency. Still, the government planned almost a hundred new projects. Perhaps one of the most important would be the airports. First, there would be a massive influx of people into the country. Estimates place the number at 600,000 travelers flooding in through international airports for the event. At the same time, with games taking place in 12 cities across the country, some more than 4,000 kilometers apart, domestic air travel would be even more critical. The bulk of the travel would be shared by 20 airports. Retrospective reports showed that in the 31 days of the event, Brazilian airports shuffled 10 million people throughout the country. Developments ranged from new runways to expanded terminals. These projects tend to take years because they require extensive safety measures. But just three years before the first match kicked off, the Brazilian government raised a red alert. Ten of the 13 airport projects were behind schedule and over budget. The government sold the operation and revenues of the three completed airports to the private sector, earning more than $10 billion, which they could inject into other projects. In the end, the most critical upgrades were completed, but not particularly well. In Sao Paulo, the new terminal at the International 
airport opened one month before kickoff. Across town, though, the other international airport had to suspend operation of their latest runway due to safety concerns. In Fortaleza, a large city in northeastern Brazil, the new terminal wasn't completed in time. Instead, passengers exited their aircraft and walked through a large tent where they collected their baggage. Several other expansions weren't completed until after the final match of the World Cup. Of course, good travel infrastructure also requires sufficient transportation methods into the city centers. As such, more than 4,300 kilometers of highways were planned along with new subways and monorails. Unfortunately, these projects didn't go any better than the airports. In the city of Ciaba, known as the Southern Gate to the Amazon, a 23-kilometer, $800 million rail line was planned to link the expanded airport to the city's downtown. In May of 2015, almost a year after the end of the World Cup, less than one kilometer of rail had been built. Monorail systems in Sao Paulo and the Amazonian city of Manaus were cancelled altogether. An expanded subway system in Belo Horizonte was also aborted. Yet, cancelled projects were far from the worst of the problems. In two cities, rushed construction led to shoddy foundations. In Sao Paulo, the monorail system was only cancelled after a considerable portion of it collapsed, killing at least one worker. This came just three days before kickoff. A month earlier in Belo Horizonte, an unfinished overpass collapsed, two people were killed, and 22 were injured. Everyone from construction workers and financiers to the country's president began pointing fingers. For most, it was the fault of the organizing committee, who had imposed strict timelines and done little to ensure workers' safety. When the games began, only one-third of the 93 projects were complete. The World Cup would be held in 12 stadiums across Brazil. Of those stadiums, seven would be brand new and five would be renovations. Aside from those that have already been mentioned, cities like Natal, Recife, Salvador, and Curitiba would host games. The stadiums ranged in capacity from 39,000 fans to 76,000. While stadiums were initially supposed to be funded by private investors, local journalists discovered that vast portions of the new arenas were financed by public banks. Had the stadiums been designed with frugality as a priority, this might not have been a problem but that wasn't the case. In most of the stadiums, not one expense was spared. This is because they were built with expensive green technology. That may seem like a good thing, but when you consider the resources that went into all of these structures, some of which would be used just a handful of times, sustainability kind of just goes out of the window. <laughs> Even just the renovations were exorbitantly expensive. The most famous example is Maracanã Stadium in Rio de Janeiro, which was initially built for the 1950 World Cup. We've covered Maracanã in depth on another video, but to sum it up, renovating the famed stadium cost more than half a billion dollars. It would host many significant events, including the tournament's final game. Despite briefly falling into disrepair, it's actually still in use today. Another drastic renovation occurred in Salvador. The Arena Fontanova was built from the ashes of its predecessor, which was demolished just before new construction began. Fontanova utilized 92% of the materials recovered from demolishing the older stadium. Despite that decision, it cost almost $250 million to build. Many of the so-called renovations, like Fontanova, actually required stadiums to be made from scratch. The most notorious venue for the tournament was the National Stadium in Brasilia. Along with Maracanã, Brasilia's National Stadium hosted seven World Cup games, the most of any pitch. Given its location in the capital, the organizing committee wanted something grand, and, well, that's what they got. Construction began in 2010, much later than expected, with a proposed budget of $300 million. Construction moved forward rapidly, though it was briefly delayed when a worker died on the job. The building was completed in 2013, and the result is really quite beautiful. The the exterior is marked with tall columns and sleek lines with a flat, disc-like roof on top. The gorgeous interior allows fans to sit up close to the action, but, well, all was not well in Brasilia. Despite its beautiful structure, the National Stadium in Brasilia became an example of just how bad things can go with World Cup ballparks. First of all, despite its initially moderate estimate of $300 million, the project went drastically over budget. The final result cost $900 million. Now, in some cases, costs like this are justifiable. After all, it was just the third most expensive football stadium worldwide, with Wembley Stadium and Tottenham Hotspur Stadium each costing more. But each of these arenas is filled throughout the year with top-flight English football 
like concerts. Brasilia's national stadium could seat more than 70,000 adoring fans, but it hasn't been full once since the end of the World Cup. That's because Brasilia's most competitive football team hasn't played in the top division since 2000. They compete admirably in the second tier, but fail miserably to sell out their arena. Even in their most significant showings of the season, attracting 20,000 fans is a stretch. Keeping the stadium intact costs millions of dollars every single year. This has earned the national stadium the title of White Elephant, a structure that's expensive to build, expensive to maintain, yet drastically underutilized. The 2014 World Cup is full of white elephants. According to global finance experts, the most costly stadiums require 10% of their building costs to maintain every year, meaning that the price for construction doubles every decade. Yet the most intriguing white elephant is, without a doubt, in the city of Manaus. Manaus is, by all accounts, an absolute wonder of a town, but its geographic location also makes it an odd one. Found in the heart of the Amazon, Manaus is 1,500 kilometers away from the nearest fellow host city. There are no roads that lead from Rio, Sao Paulo, or Brasilia to Manaus. The only way to get there is to fly or to take a ship down one of the region's many rivers. This all makes for a beautiful place to host events, but not the most practical. Materials for the area's construction had to be shipped in by expensive means. Given its location in the middle of the world's largest rainforest, hot and humid weather created extreme conditions for builders and footballers alike. Three workers were killed during construction. Locals, though reportedly proud that their oft-forgotten city would briefly hold the gaze of the world's football fans, eventually saw the stadium as just a colossal waste of money. That's because Manaus received little investment from the federal government in its infrastructure, despite being the seventh largest city in Brazil. Like all of its counterparts, the Amazon Arena, as it's called, is beautiful and state-of-the-art. However, since its completion, it's rarely housed more than a thousand fans at a time. Of course, there are other white elephants in Brazil. In Cuiaba, the $215 million Pantanal Stadium had to be shut down less than a year after the games to repair some shoddy construction work. The stadium's unused locker rooms became shelters for the area's homeless population. Even in football-obsessed Brazil, it can be tough to justify building a several hundred million dollar football stadium. In November of 2018, when a local publication polled the Brazilian public, 80% of respondents said they were happy about their nation hosting the World Cup and believed it would benefit their country. By 2004, that number dropped to 48% thanks to many construction delays and lack of public infrastructure development. In the months leading up to kickoff, protests began in many of the nation's largest cities. FIFA representatives insisted that the legacy of hosting the games would make it all worthwhile. <laughs> The Football Federation even committed $20 million to so-called legacy projects. Yet, that laughably small sum becomes much worse when you look at the whole host of controversies that the Brazilian people were protesting. Hosting the World Cup requires serious accommodations to FIFA by the host country's government. FIFA reaps most of the profits from the event. In the case of 2014, that's about $3 billion, despite only putting forward about $2 billion in funding. FIFA doesn't pay taxes on that income, nor do they pay taxes on spending within the country. Of course, this is all in the name of public benefits, but often forgotten are those that the World Cup actually hurts. We've already mentioned a handful of deaths during construction, but there were other victims. In Rio de Janeiro, huge neighborhoods of favelas were destroyed to make room for new development. Tenants were rarely compensated for their loss and sometimes were just given a few hours' notice to pack up their goods and find new housing. Where favelas once stood, the government built a parking garage for the nearby football stadium. To make matters worse, most of the population in the demolished favelas were indigenous peoples who rarely receive any type of recognition or aid from the government. The America's Program for International Policy estimated that 170,000 people countrywide were displaced. Brazil's most legendary footballers all called out the lack of investment in public infrastructure. Stadiums were built in areas where they had no future use, dozens of people died, and hundreds of thousands had their lives changed for the worse. But at least they had football, right? To many fans, the 2014 World Cup had some of the most enjoyable football ever. For Brazil, their team made it to the tournament semi-final where they lost 7-1 to Germany, one of the most embarrassing displays in the event's history. To Brazilians, the legacy of the World Cup is beyond complicated. To many, it's still entirely negative. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.